Good morning. So this week, the week ahead, today's Palm Sunday. Monday, Thursday comes up later, and then Good Friday, and then Resurrection Sunday. And by God's providence, not by my expert planning, we find ourselves in Romans 8, 16 to 17. And it's a perfect place for us to be as we begin this week. As we saw last week here in Romans 8, 16 and 17, Paul talks about two things. He talks about suffering and glory. And those two words, if you look at them, they best describe this week. We're about to celebrate the week between Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday. In fact, if you think about Jesus's week, it actually went like this. Glory to unimaginable suffering to even greater glory. And it was all in a week's time. In one week, Jesus went from being hailed as king to being crucified as a criminal to being exalted as king of kings and lord of lords. That's quite a week, isn't it? On Palm Sunday, Jesus rode into Jerusalem to cheering crowds. Who wouldn't be cheering for him? After all, what had he done just a few days earlier? He had raised Lazarus from the dead. And if Jesus could do that, then certainly he could drive the Romans out of Jerusalem. But there was something very different about the way Jesus rode into Jerusalem that Palm Sunday. In the ancient Near East, a king entered cities, usually riding on a war horse to convey his military might and power, particularly when he was entering into a newly conquered city. He did this to prove he was legitimate and he had power to maintain his rule. The exception to this custom was when a beloved king would return to his own capital city. There he would ride into town on a donkey. He would come as a benevolent king looking for the good of his people. In our earlier responsive reading from Zechariah 9.9, what did we hear the prophet Zechariah say? He spoke of a day when Jerusalem would see her victorious king return, and he would be riding on a donkey, riding into town to bring good to his people. On Palm Sunday, Jesus rode into Jerusalem to conquer, but he rode in riding on a donkey, not a war horse. Because he wasn't coming to defeat the Romans. He was coming to work good for his people. Jesus was coming to defeat a different enemy, conquer that enemy once and for all, to bring good to his people by securing a lasting salvation and establishing a new rule and reign of peace for all. This hope of the one true king riding on a donkey led the crowd to shout out, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The people knew exactly what it meant as Jesus was riding into town on that donkey. This was their king who was coming to work good on their behalf. And on Palm Sunday, they, they held him as such. Son of David was an acknowledgement that Jesus and the, it was the Messiah. The, the one who would come from David's family line to bring lasting peace to Jerusalem. And Hosanna means save, please. And yet this crowd soon became an angry mob that would cry for blood. Five days later, they would be shouting, crucify him. And they did. But three days later, Jesus rose from the grave as a conquering king of kings, completely defeating Satan and sin and death. Think about what Paul tells us about Jesus in Philippians 2. In, in Philippians 2, 6, though Jesus was in the form of God, he did, not account, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Jesus was God. He had glory, real glory, eternal glory. It was all his, but he willingly emptied himself and took the nature of a servant. That's what Paul tells us in verses 7 and 8 as he goes on. Jesus emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Think what happened to Jesus when he came and he took on flesh. Think what mankind did to God the moment we could lay our hands on him. We caused him to suffer and to die. 
We literally murdered God the first chance we get. What does that say about the condition of the human heart? But because Jesus was willing to humble himself, enduring from sinners such hostility against himself, to die for those who were the cause of his suffering, God exalted him and crowned him with an even greater glory. That's what Paul says as he goes on in Philippians 2.9. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what is the pattern that we see with Jesus in those verses that Paul shares with us in Philippians 2. It's the pattern that we've already seen play itself out in that week between Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday. Glory to intense suffering to even greater glory. This is the pattern. It's the pattern of the gospel. It's the upside down nature of the kingdom of heaven. The way up to glory is first down in humility. The way to become royalty is first to become a servant. Paul wrote what he wrote about Jesus in Philippians 2 for a purpose. And he tells us what that purpose is in verse 6. It's to be a pattern for how we live. He says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Paul's saying, you need to think like Jesus. The pattern of Jesus in Philippians 2 is to be the pattern of your life. The way up is down. Suffering precedes glory. Here in Romans 8, this is what Paul's telling us. is the pattern of our sonship. It's a pattern that exactly follows the sonship of Jesus. Hear the word of the Lord from Romans 8, 16 and 17. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him, in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Suffering and glory. Do you see what Paul's saying? We are fellow heirs with Christ to both of these things. In fact, Paul's writing chapter 8 to give us assurance of our salvation. And, and suffering, he's telling us, is actually part of that assurance. The way we know one day we will be glorified is because we suffer as Jesus suffered. We join Jesus in his suffering. That's not how we often think, though, is it? We often think if God loves me, then what? Well, good things ought to happen to me. Sure, maybe a little suffering to get me on the right path, but once I'm on that right path, it ought to be smooth sailing. I ought to be able to get to the mountaintop without doing any mountaineering, without any exertion, without any hard climbing. But that's not how this works. And Jesus never promised us that that was how this works. John 16, In this world, you will have tribulation. It's a promise of Jesus. Right there. Yet we often don't claim that promise, do we? Not like we claim other promises, at least. Luke 9, 23. And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. What was the cross? It was an instrument of torture and death. Jesus isn't giving us here a way to avoid suffering. He's opening the door for us to enter into suffering with him calling us to willingly come and join him. So as we think about suffering, especially Christ's suffering, I came up with five points that I'd like us to consider this morning. First, the parentage of suffering. Second, the problem of suffering. Third, the power of suffering. Fourth, how we poison the process of suffering. And fifth, processing suffering properly. Now, that's a lot of peas. And I had to struggle to kind of come up with that first one to make it fit. I stretched the, the SARS as far as I could. What on earth do I mean by the parentage of suffering? Simply this, where did suffering come from? What is its origin? If God made everything good, then why is there suffering? Some people say, well, that's proof the Bible's not true. That's proof there is no God. It's at least proof that God's not loving. God's not powerful. Suffering proves all that. 
But if we look at our Bibles, we, we find the answer to why there's suffering right there at the beginning in Genesis 3. Suffering came into the world because of sin. As we know from Genesis 3, sin brought a curse upon man and creation. Because of sin, life became very hard. Creation now rebels against our rule. There are droughts that cause famines and floods and storms that cause destruction. There is disease. There is death. The curse of sin, it affects every human being. It doesn't matter how good or bad we are. We will all suffer. Think about it. Jesus was the best, right? He was perfectly righteous. He was goodness personified, and yet he suffered like no one else ever has or ever will. Why would we ever think that by being good, somehow all will get blessing and we'll never face any suffering? That's not Jesus's life. Why would we expect it to be ours? But even sin itself often brings suffering. Think of the suffering that comes from a broken relationship. What is it that causes the broken relationship in the first place? I guarantee it is always pride and selfishness and nothing else. Those of you who endure divorce or a broken relationship with a parent or a child or a relative or a friend, you know how painful this kind of suffering is and it's all brought on by sin. Sometimes the consequences of our sin bring suffering to our lives and the lives of others. A child disobeys their parent. and What happens? They suffer. They're grounded. A man drinks too much and gets behind the wheel of the car and injures somebody else. And they bring suffering not just to the person they injured, but to themselves and to the loved ones of both. A woman desires to get ahead in life. So what does she do? She compromises her virtue. And as a result, ends up living in guilt and shame. But sin also brings suffering to us in another hidden way. Mankind was created to have glory, right? We were made in the image of God. We were given authority by God to rule and reign over creation. It's a glorious position God gave us. But instead of being humble servants of our creator and pride, what did we do? We rebelled. We tried to usurp God's authority. When Eve took the fruit from Satan, everything changed. She took that fruit because Satan convinced her if she took it, she would be like God, no longer dependent upon God. When that happened, when we sin, usurp God's authority, we lost the glory that was ours. We were created in the image of God, but now what happened? The image was marred. We were made to rule and reign over creation, but now creation rebels against us just as we rebelled against God. We lost glory, and that loss of glory, you know what it does? It creates an emptiness, a longing inside of us. We know we're missing something we were created to have. The emptiness in us is part of the answer to the origin of suffering. Here's why. The Hebrew word for glory is the word kabod, and it literally means weighty or heavy. So, for instance, when we speak of God's glory, what do we say? He's the heaviest, the weightiest thing out there. When mankind fell in the garden, we lost the weightiness that God created us to have. And we feel that loss. We feel that emptiness. And we spend our lives looking for a way to try to fill the emptiness and get glory back. And this actually is the cause of much of our feelings of suffering, isn't it? We want things to fill that emptiness in our life. And when we can't get those things, we feel like we're suffering. Many times when we feel like we're suffering, it's because we don't have something like health or finances or success or power or relationships that we're looking to to give us that weight in our lives, to give our lives glory, to make us feel complete and fulfilled and happy. The quest to fill the emptiness in our lives spills out of our life and affects the life of others. Why are people oppressed? Because someone's hungering for power and to get that power to try to fill the emptiness in their lives, what do they do? They exert their will over the lives of others. And that brings us to one last form of suffering that comes as a result of sin. It's a form of suffering that only comes to Christians, though. It's persecution. 
Jesus said in John 15, 18, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. Why on earth would the world hate Jesus? Simply because of who he was. Why does the world hate Christians? Simply because of who we are. Persecution for the sake of Christ is something peculiar to Christians. Paul knew it. He knew that kind of suffering well. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty four. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. Suffering like this. Well, it raises questions in our minds, doesn't it? Why would God allow those who were serving Jesus, those who love Jesus, to suffer and be persecuted like this? If God loves his people, why do they suffer? For centuries, philosophers have tried to use suffering to undermine the character and existence of God, saying things like, if there is a God who is loving and powerful, then why is there suffering? Why doesn't God do something about it? If there's suffering, it must mean there's no God. Or maybe it means that God's not loving. Or maybe it means God's not powerful. Those questions, they have a very short-term view of suffering, though, don't they? They're just looking in the moment. If you take a longer-term view of suffering, you can see God is indeed doing something about it. You can see that in his love and power, God has moved and worked to bring an end to suffering. That's what Easter week is all about. In love and power, what did Jesus do? He clothed himself in the weakness of our flesh and he came and he suffered oppression and persecution at the hands of sinful men. Peter in his sermon at Pentecost sums it up well in Acts 2, 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God delivered him up, but sinful and lawless men killed him. Why? Why did Jesus come in weakness? Why did God allow his son to be killed? To bear our sin. 1 Peter 2.24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. And Jesus went as low as a person could possibly go, not just suffering and dying, but being completely cut off from and forsaken by the Father. By doing that, the curse of sin was broken and the power of sin and the power of Satan and the power of death were defeated. 1 Corinthians 15, 54, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Listen, what I'm about to say is hard, but very true. If a person is a Christian, I want you to know this, all suffering is good. Because at the cross, Christ was victorious and he transformed our suffering into something glorious. C.S. Lewis summarizes it this way in, in his book, The Great Divorce. This is what mortals misunderstand. They say of some temporal suffering, no future bliss can make up for it. Not knowing that heaven once attained will work backwards and turn even that agony into glory. That's power to be able to turn agony and suffering into glory. That's love, to be willing to go to the lengths that God went to, to make that happen. In the end, suffering will indeed prove that there is a God who is good and loving and powerful because only a good and loving and powerful God would do what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. At the cross, what did God do? He took what Satan intended for evil and he turned it into the greatest, the most ultimate good for our lives. That is the power of suffering. In Jesus, we see what suffering can accomplish. Last week, we talked about how God uses our suffering both to confirm and to conform. 
Our suffering confirms that we're God's children because God allows discipline to come to those he loves. And God also uses our suffering to do what? To conform us more and more to the image of his son. Now, since this week, all my main points start with the letter P, I would thought I would throw in a few sub points that begin with a P as well. So let's take a moment to talk about how the power of suffering purifies us and how the power of suffering proves our faith through perseverance. How does suffering purify us? Again, C.S. Lewis, who wrote a lot about suffering and glory, said this, pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our consciences, but shouts in our pains. It is his, it is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. God uses suffering to do what? To get our attention. Maybe it's as simple as allowing consequences of sin to linger on in our lives so we no longer desire to engage in that sinful activity. When our son was in high school, he insisted in being uh, part of Honors English and later AP English. This in spite of the fact that while he was very gifted in math and science, well, he wasn't quite so gifted in the English language, at least not back then. The apple doesn't far, far from the tree. He didn't really like to read at all, and to be in those classes, you had to do summer reading of books they called the classics, books his dad never would have picked up and read just for the fun of it. For the first few summers, though, his mother and I cajoled him and we begged him and we pleaded with him to begin reading at the beginning of summer and to read through the summer, to not let it go to the last minute. After a couple of summers, though, of being consumed with worry and him constantly saying, what, me worry? I finally just decided the only way he would learn would be if he suffered the consequences of putting off all the reading till the end of the summer. So I just let him go. I, I took no joy in his pain at the end of the summer. Well, actually, that's not true. I kind of did. But God is a much better father than I am. And this is what God sometimes does to purify us. He allows the consequences of our sin to hit us and to remain with us as a deterrent to us continuing to live in sin. But in addition to that, listen to what Peter says in, in 1 Peter 4.12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Peter's use of the phrase fiery trial, it, it draws on how a goldsmith would have refined gold and silver in Peter's day. They would have used a very hot fire to melt the metal to a molten state. And as they did this, the precious metal would sink to the bottom of the crucible and, and, the, and the impurities would rise to the top. The goldsmith could get, then skim those impurities off, leaving only the pure metal behind. And the way a goldsmith would know the refining process was complete was when he could look at the molten metal and see the reflection of his face. This is how God uses sufferings in our life to refine us, isn't it? The fiery trials we go through separate out sinful attitudes and tendencies so they can be put aside and done away with. As that happens, we more and more reflect the image of Jesus. As you think about that, I want you to notice that it really doesn't matter what the source of the impurities is, what the source of the suffering is. God uses every bit of it to purify us. He certainly uses things that come into our lives as a result of the curse of sin to purify us. Things like persecution and oppression and broken relationships and even illness. But he also uses our sin and the consequences of our sin to refine us. As I've told you for many years, success was my God that I chased after. I wouldn't have admitted that, but it's true. I kept trying to grab hold of that God of success for all it was worth. And each time I thought I was about to grab hold of success, do you know what God did? He broke my fingers. And he made me let go. And let me tell you, it, it hurt. It really hurt every time he did that. 
but what a mercy it was in my life that God did that. Success was my idol, and if God had let me lay hold of success and hang on to it, I can pretty much assure you I wouldn't be standing here before you today. I'd be probably puttering along on a beach somewhere, very full of myself, but also very empty and then weightless on the inside. The pain of having my fingers broken so many times reminds me daily that the only success that's really worth having is the success of one day hearing Jesus say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. And I don't honestly know if I'll ever hear those words because I have spiritual attention deficit disorder and, and like a dog, I keep returning to the vomit of that God of success. But my fingers, they, they've been broken so many times that it's actually become very hard to, to hold on to anything. And that's a good place for me to be because it means that I just simply have to keep trusting Jesus to hold on to me. God often uses our suffering to strip away everything else that we're trusting in, trusting in and looking to to give us comfort and happiness so that we see our need to simply rely upon Jesus for those things. It's painful and it's hard, but it's good. This is why Peter and Paul and James, they all say that we should rejoice in our trials. Romans 5, 3 and 5, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Suffering is God's way of purifying, refining our lives to conform us to the image of Jesus so that the image of Jesus shows in our life. We should rejoice that God is at work doing this. And that brings me to the other P we want to talk about here under the power of suffering. And that is the power of suffering to prove our faith through perseverance. Look again at what Paul says in Romans 5.3. Suffering produces endurance, or if you will, perseverance. We won't take long here, but all we have to do is think about Job. Why did Satan say that Job worshipped God? It's right there in Job 1, 9 and 11. Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. So what was Satan saying? Job only worships you, God, because, well, you've made his life good. Of course he worships you. But you let me take away everything from him and, and I guarantee you he'll curse you. Now, as you read the rest of the book of Job, Job struggled mightily to persevere in his faith. He had no idea what was going on. But he did hang on. And what was the result? Well, when you get to the end of the book of Job, you see Job's changed. He's humbled through the process. All he can do is put his hand over his mouth and repent in dust and ashes. Persevering and suffering, though, you know what it did? It proved that Job's faith in God was justified and genuine. When you continue to cling to God when everything's falling apart, you prove you trust and love God simply for who he is, not just for what he does for you. Persevering in faith during suffering that comes as a result of anything, even sin, is the greatest evidence that a person can have that they are a true child of God, an heir of God, a fellow heir with Christ. Because when you persevere in faith in the midst of trials and suffering, it shows that you're holding on to God and you're loving God when there's seemingly no logical reason to do that. Notice I said even sin. There's no greater assurance of faith that we can have other than that when we sin, rather than running and hiding, what do we do? We turn to Jesus and we cling to him for forgiveness and cleansing. Why would we do that if we weren't really trusting him? The greatest proof that you are trusting Jesus isn't that you're such a good person. It is that when you sin, you run to Jesus. Why would a person continue to trust Jesus as Lord of their life when they're suffering like Job suffered? 
because they know and they live in the assurance of what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.17, this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Job is probably one of the first books of the Bible that was written. He didn't have all the rest of the Bible, especially not the books of the New Testament. But he still understood that weight of glory, that it was worth it all to persevere in his faith. Think of that through Job's perseverance. Think what happened. As Job faced suffering and clung to God, God was glorified and Satan was disgraced. What an awesome thing for a human being to be able to do. What a privilege for us to participate in this cosmic warfare between God and Satan. This is what we were made to do, bring glory to God and disgrace Satan in the process. In just this tiny example from Job, we can see the purifying power of suffering Job was changed, but we can also see the power of perseverance to assure us that faith is real and that we truly do belong to God. Now that almost brings me to my last P, but before we get there, I need to talk of one other P first, and that is how we can poison the process of our suffering. If we endure the suffering process, we can see the much good comes of that. Suffering will accomplish amazing things in our lives. It will purify us. It will conform us to the image of Jesus. It will assure us of our salvation as we persevere in faith. It will bring glory to God and it will be the source of eternal joy as we see how God used suffering to accomplish his purpose in our life, bringing us to glory, to be with him forever. But that can only happen if we allow God to work through our suffering. The problem is too often we poison the process of suffering by short-circuiting it. How do we short-circuit the process? Three ways. Anger, avoidance, and apathy. Sometimes in anger we blame or even curse God for our suffering. And rather than drawing near to God at the suffering and allowing him to work, what do we do? We, we push God away. I remember one day back when I was chasing success, and God was keeping me from it for my own good. I was out in the yard trimming a bush, except I wasn't trimming it at all. I was just whacking away at it. I guess that makes me a bushwhacker. Anyway, my sweet wife came outside and observed what was going on, and she said, honey, what did that bush do to you? Why all the anger? I replied, the bush didn't do anything, but I am angry. I am angry at God, and I need to take my frustrations out on something. You know, as I think about it, it's amazing I'm even able to stand here and relate that story to you. It's proof of God's mercy, isn't it? What a fool. But sometimes rather than anger poisoning the process of suffering, avoidance does instead. Here's one I think everybody falls into, every Christian falls into. Think how much time and effort we spend praying that God will simply make problems go away rather than praying that God would work through the suffering to accomplish his good purpose in our life of purifying us. Maybe we even try to avoid suffering by finding something to numb the pain of it. Something to distract us. But the only way suffering can accomplish God's purpose in purifying us and proving our faith to be genuine is if we embrace it and engage with it, allowing God to work through it. Maybe instead of praying so hard for God to take it away, we should learn to pray like my friend Charlie. Charlie was in real estate development back in Florida and it was in the middle of a crash and he was in deep trouble. I was in an accountability group with him and I still remember him praying, Lord, I don't know what you're trying to teach me in this, but I wish you would make me learn whatever it is quickly so all this could be over with. You know, it's not wrong to pray and ask God to relieve the suffering, but even more important, we should pray and ask God to work through the suffering to accomplish his good purpose. And that really is faith, isn't it, to do that? It's like trusting a surgeon to cut you open. And that brings me to the last A that can poison the process of suffering, apathy. Whatever. 
It doesn't matter. It is what it is. I'll just grip my teeth and bear it. You know what? It is what it is. And it is all part of God's purpose. And if we just dismiss it, if we make light of it or trivialize it, we short circuit what God's trying to do in our lives. Rather than anger, rather than avoidance, rather than apathy, we need to embrace suffering. We need to learn how to engage in the proper process of suffering. So look what Paul says in Romans 8, 17. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Now, glory is what we're going to spend all next week talking about, but we've seen a glimpse of it this week, haven't we? What could be more glorious than taking on more and more of the image of Jesus in our lives? What could be more glorious than one day hearing Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant? What could be more glorious than being able to spit in Satan's face as we endure suffering, running with perseverance the race that's marked out for us, bringing glory to God? In the Greek, the word consider is actually an accounting word. On one side of the ledger, you have the pain of suffering, and what do you have on the other side? The weight of glory that is to be revealed in us. What's Paul saying to us? There's no comparison. The ledger is completely out of balance. In this life, sometimes it feels like suffering is outweighing the glory, but that's just because we're not really properly seeing the glory that is to be revealed in us. Sometimes we need to make ourselves stop and take a proper accounting to remind ourselves of the true state of things. For a Christian, the way up is down. For a Christian, suffering proceeds Glory, 2 Corinthians 4.16, again, so we do not lose heart. Why? Because we're making this accounting. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. How? By, by making this accounting. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. This Easter week, do you know what it proves to us? It proves that suffering precedes glory. It proves that the way up is down. Jesus meant what he said. We really do need to follow him. Jesus indeed took a proper accounting of everything. The sufferings of the cross, which accomplished our salvation, was nothing compared to the eternal weight of glory of being given a name that's above every name. Hebrews 12, 2, the writer of Hebrews says, Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Do you see what Jesus did as he went to the cross? He took an accounting, an accounting that allows him, allowed him to despise the shame of the cross. Jesus knew the way up was down in suffering, like Jesus, let us rejoice in suffering, knowing that the light and momentary afflictions that we face today, no matter how great they may seem to be, pale in comparison to the eternal weight of glory that is ours through what Christ has accomplished for us at the cross. Let's pray. Father, it is easy for us to forget this. It is easy for us to have one of those A's in our suffering, to have anger or avoidance or apathy. Father, I pray that we would embrace the suffering you bring our way, that we would let the power of suffering work its process in our lives to conform us to the image of Jesus, to bring glory to you. I pray that you would give us endurance to persevere in our faith, even when things are pressing hard against us. Remind us of the eternal weight of glory that is ours in Christ, especially this week as we look to the cross and we look to the resurrection. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.